to go. Brilliant stuff. Um, we're continuing this evening our series in Philippians, thinking about what it looks like to have joy in the gospel. And, and we're in chapter three now. Um, so if you want to turn there, if you've got your Bible on your lap or on your phone, do feel free to flick to Philippians chapter three. I'm going to read from verses one to 11, and it's also going to come up on the screen. Um, so Johnny, when you're ready, if you could flick that up for us. Excellent. There it is. Let me read to us. Let's read God's word together. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers, for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I had gain, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss for, of the, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of, from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is God's word. Well, tonight we're going to think a bit about true confidence. Confidence is an interesting word in our language. It's an interesting concept. I think generally it's a good thing. It's something that can be desired. You want to do life with confidence that your friends are going to be there for you when you need them. You want to do life with confidence that you're going to be able to pay the bills. You want to do life with confidence that you're going to be able to um, ring 999 and they're going to um, come and sort you out, come and save you or whatever you need. You want to be able to do life with confidence. You'd love to be able to do life with confidence that things are going to be okay in the future, that, that at some point we are going to come out of lockdown. Wouldn't, wouldn't we love to, to have confidence and be able to be confident about life? However, confidence can become a negative thing, or there can be negative aspects to it. Because, for instance, when someone has too much confidence, they have overconfidence, or it can become arrogance. Think of perhaps a, a kind of current example of this. is Someone like Donald Trump, who is so confident that whatever he says is gold and it's right and everyone should follow what he does that actually he can end up being a little bit rude and and, and cutting people down and and kind of my way is the highway type attitude confidence can also be fragile and that's because confidence is only really as strong as the object we put our confidence in and isn't the current climate isn't our current um situation such a a, 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 an example of how fragile the things that we once maybe put all our confidence in, how fragile they can be. Our job security for a lot of people is fragile right now. Our financial situation, our health, we can't necessarily be confident in those things when perhaps we once were. Wouldn't it be great to do life with a true confidence? Not a confidence that is brash and arrogant and all, and all about me, 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 me. And not a confidence that is fragile and that goes up and down and is wobbly. Wouldn't it be, conf wouldn't it be amazing to have a, a true, unshakable, steady confidence throughout the whole of life? Well, that is what is off on offer in our passage today. True confidence. And our passage tells us where it is not found and where it is found. True confidence is what a passage offers, and it tells us where it is not found and where it is found. So firstly, where is it not found? Well, our passage tonight is a story about Paul. 
The Apostle Paul, one of Jesus' first followers, met Jesus in the flesh. Um, and he's given us, over the last couple of weeks, various examples of what it looks like to live life with uh, the gospel at the centre. What it looks like to have joy in the gospel. Last week, Daniel spoke to us about, Daniel, uh, about Timothy and Epaphroditus. And this week, Paul um, takes his own life as an example of what it looks like to keep the gospel central. And he gives a kind of a before and after picture of his life and what he places his confidence in. Let me read to us verses 4 to 6 again. Paul says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So it appears on the face of it, Paul has loads of stuff, a big long list of things that he can be confident about. Now we might read this verse as 21st century readers and think, okay, big deal. Why is Paul so confident about these things? But the thing is, in Paul's day, these are things that would have brought him status and wealth and power and reputation. People would have looked at his life and gone, Paul's got it sorted. He was the ultimate religious man. And he was so zealous and passionate for this way of life that he was willing to, to push people out of the way, to persecute them if they uh, questioned the things he had confidence in. And his religious cohorts and colleagues would have looked at Paul and gone, God is pleased with you. And Paul would have looked at these things and thought, these things, tick, 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 God must be pleased with me. And that's what it means when Paul uses this term, confidence in the flesh. He's basically saying, I had loads of reasons to be confident in what I did. Confident in who I was. The flesh is referring to kind of physical life, physical deeds. And Paul is looking to these physical things for his confidence. I wonder if any of us can relate to that right now. I wonder what you put your confidence in. For most of us, it won't be the fact that we're from Israel or, th or that we, perhaps not that we keep the law perfectly. But if you boil it down, Paul is basically saying that he used to put his identity in uh, his, his confidence in his identity and his achievements. He used to put his, his, his confidence in the fact he was from Israel and the, uh, and the fact that he was able to keep the law. His identity and his achievements were the ground for his confidence. I wonder what you place your confidence in. If you're not sure, there's a couple of questions you can ask to help figure this out. One question is, what is it you think makes you a good person? And secondly, what is it that gives you hope? What is it that makes you a good person? Question one. What is it you, that makes you confident that you're okay? That God would accept you if he, if, he, if he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What makes you a good person? And also, what gives you hope? So what makes you confident that even though stuff might be hard now, what gives you confidence that everything's going to be okay in the end. In order to answer these questions, lots of us turn to our identity and our achievements. Lots of us think, well, you might think I'm from a religious family. I, I've gone to church all my life, so therefore I'm a good person. Or I've done all this stuff. Look at how helpful I've been to my neighbours over the last few weeks. I've given X amount to charity. Therefore, I'm a good person. That's similar to what Paul was doing. He's looking to his identity and his achievements to show that he was a good person. Or what gives you hope? That's the other question. Again, we can look to our identity. We can look to, um, I, I'm full of grit and determination. I'm, I'm a proud Mancunian and I've always sorted out all my problems and I trust in my ability to, to get through. Even though stuff's bad, I've got the all it takes to look after myself and sort things out for myself. Or I'm a parent and I've always provided for my family and I, and I trust that I have the skills to be able to do that. 
or perhaps you look to your achievements to give you hope. Oh, stuff's bad now, but I know I've got a good job. I've got money coming in, so stuff's going to be okay in the end. It's really easy to place our confidence in these things. Really easy. I wonder what it is for you. It might be some of those things. It might be something different. The thing is, these, these are all good things. They're all things that we can be thankful for. But at the same time, these things are fragile. And I think, as I said before, the current climate shows that. These things can easily be taken away for us, from us or... Um, or our confidence in them can easily be shaken, which leads to worry and fear. Um, it can lead us to questioning our value as people when these, these things are threatened. On the flip side, when we're so confident in our identity or our achievements, it can lead to, to anger and, 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 and looking down on other people. That's what, what happened to Paul in verse 6. He was so full of zeal, so confident in who he was and what he did, that he was willing to knock people out of the way and look down on people who, 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 who questioned his ways. We see that in our, in our current culture, don't we? That's a hot topic at the moment. People looking down on others. People seeing others as, 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 as less um, than themselves. When we put our confidence in the things of this world, we, we easily swing between underconfidence and overconfidence we easily swing between fear and and pride because the things of this world are fragile i don't know about you i love a bargain i love buying something on the cheap i well, basically when i when i buy something my one criteria is how little can i spend um, and when I was at uni, I got into a really uh, good pattern of buying really cheap shoes. And there was this one pair from Primark that I just bought again and again and again and again because um, they looked pretty awesome um, and they were dead cheap, about six pounds. But the thing is, with these, this pair of shoes, as soon as I put them on, as soon, pretty much as soon as I tied the laces, you could kind of feel them beginning to creak and beginning to the seams beginning to loosen. As soon as I began to walk on them, they pretty much began to fall apart. And they always ended up doing that thing where the shoe kind of flaps about and the sole was kind of detached. As soon as they were put under any stress, the shoes would break because they were fragile. And the point of telling that story is that putting our confidence in the things of this world is a bit like me placing my confidence in those shoes. The things of this world, as soon as they come under stress and strain, can so easily be taken away from us. Our, the things of this world are fragile. And, we, and, and we can't, they cannot give us true confidence. So where can true confidence be found? Well, the rest of our passage shows us. Shows us. Before, before we dive in, I want to tell you a bit about my my student, another story from my student days, actually. Um, towards the end of uni, me and a couple of my friends moved into what we thought was the ultimate bachelor pad. We, um, it, was this, it was this ground floor flat, and it was uh, in a quite a cool area of, of, of Manchester. Uh, and we thought we were living the dream. And we brought some, some, some cool furniture. We had a PlayStation set up, and we had a big TV and all this. And, and it was great, and, and, and we had some good times. But the thing is, now that I've spent a few years uh, living with Beth, I, I now know what it really looks like to live in a nice house and have nice furniture and to live in a clean house. And I look back and I actually go, that was pretty messy. That was pretty grotty. We, we, we left that place pretty, pretty grubby. Because of what I have now, I look back and go, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't brilliant. And that's what Paul is saying here about his, his life. He's saying in the rest of this passage, he's saying because of what I have now, I look back and go, that was rubbish. Because of how amazing my situation is now, I look back and go, oh man, I'm, I, what was I doing? So let's read, let's, let's dive into these verses. From verse 7, Paul says this. He says, whatever I had gained, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul was putting, before remember, he was putting all his confidence in, in the things that he did and in, and in who he was. But now he says, but whatever I had gained, but all these things I had, I now count for loss, as loss, for the sake of Christ. 
And in verse 8, he adds emphasis to this. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Paul here is saying that, that Jesus is so wonderful. He is so worth having, so worth knowing that this old stuff doesn't, even, doesn't just count as nothing, but counts as loss. And at the end of verse 8, he describes them as rubbish. That, that word literally translates as, as dung. He's saying, compared to Jesus, compared to the ultimate wonderful worth of Jesus, everything else is as much value to me as poo. That is literally what Paul is saying. Why does he, in his own words, suffer the loss of these things? Why does he turn away from putting his confidence in the flesh? It says at the end of verse 8, In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Why is Christ so worth it? Why is he, he worth turning away from all these things? Why does he make all of these other things look so worthless? Well, remember those two questions we talked about a minute ago? The answer to those questions is Jesus. Question one was, was how do you know you're a good person? And question two is, what gives you hope? And the only true answer to those questions and the, the only way we can have true confidence in the light of those questions, is to look to Jesus. So question one, what makes you a good person? Paul has the answer in verse nine. And he basically says this, he says, I know I'm not a good person, but I know I'm accepted. Let me read verse nine to us. The Bible's flipped over. Here we go, verse nine. Paul wants to be found in him, found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of God that depends on faith. So Paul uses this word righteousness, which at youth group we often say means to be right with God, to be in a right standing with God, to be accepted by God. And Paul says that I'm accepted by God, I'm righteous, and that doesn't come from me. My righteousness is not my own, Paul is saying. It comes from outside me. It comes from faith in Christ. And that's because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he did a swap. He took on our sin on his shoulders and he gave us his righteousness. And that's what it means now for us to be found in Christ, that God looks on us, for those of us who trust in Jesus, and he sees not our messy deeds, not the things we've done wrong, but he sees the perfect record of Christ's righteousness. Paul knows he isn't good, but he knows that he is accepted. And because of that, he has true confidence. He can have true confidence because he knows that God will accept him and that won't change. And, it, and because it's, he's found in Christ, because of his trust and faith in Christ, it's not an acceptance that's going to go up and down. It's not, oh, he's had a good day and stuff's gone well. So he's a bit more accepted. Oh, he's had a bit of a shocking day. He's missed his alarm and he, he's, a, he, he's had a bit of a, his sandals are broken and he's been late for his meeting with the other apostles and he's a bit less accepted. He knows he's just as accepted any day because he's found in Christ and therefore he can have true confidence in any situation, not based on him, but because his righteousness, righteousness his, acceptance from, his, his acceptance with God is because of faith in Christ. So therefore he has true confidence. He knows he's not good. But he knows he's accepted. And that's true of anyone who trusts in Jesus. You realise you're not a good person. You realise all the things you were putting your confidence in count as loss. But you know that you are accepted, found in Christ, when you put your trust in him. Jesus answers that first question. But Jesus also answers the second question we thought about. Where is our hope? What gives us confidence that even though stuff, life is tough, that everything is going to be okay. How can we really know that everything is going to be okay? Well, I think we see the answer in verse 10. Paul says, I consider all this stuff loss, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and that by any means possible I may attain resurrection from the dead. Paul has true confidence he has hope because he knows where he is going. And that's because he, he, he cl he's clinging to the power of Jesus' resurrection. 
And Paul here knows he's going to suffer. He knows he's going to die. But he knows that there will be purpose in his suffering. And that in even the worst situations in life, he can have hope. Because he's clinging to the power of Jesus' resurrection. And that gives him true confidence, which is unshakable. And that can give us true confidence, which is unshakable. Because for those who trust in Christ, we know where we are going. The resurrection from the dead. Eternal life with Jesus forever. Death is destroyed. The worst thing that can happen to you in this life is, has been dealt with by Christ. If you are trusting in Jesus and one day you will be with him. And you can know because, you, because of what Jesus has done for you that God will accept you. We know where we're going. We know we're, we are not good people but we know we are accepted. So we can have true confidence in any situation in life. And that's a confidence that's, that's not based on us. It's not a confidence that says, oh, look at me, I'm amazing, because it's a confidence that goes, I now have no confidence in the flesh. That's what verse 3 is talking about. It says, God's people, the people who worship by the Spirit and glory in Jesus Christ, put no confidence in the flesh. I know that I bring nothing to the table. We sung it earlier. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. That's saying I'm not going to lean on anything else in this world, but I'm going to wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. As we come to a close, where is your confidence? What are you putting your hope in? What are you trusting that makes you a good person? What do you look at and go, yeah, it's all going to be okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Is it in the flesh is it in earthly things and if it is can I ask you how is that standing up for you right now is that is your confidence in those things unshakable and how are those things going to help you when it comes to times of suffering how are those things going to help you when you stand before God at the end of your life how are those things going to help you in the face of death And if you are here and you're trusting in Christ, we can can know, and and it's another song we sung earlier, that we have hope in life and death, and that is in Christ alone. That he is our only confidence, and that's because we belong to him. And we have a hope that is eternal, that springs eternal, that's never going to end. Because we confess that Christ is our hope in life and death. True confidence is found in Christ and Christ alone. Not in our identity, not in our achievements, but in him. Will you trust him this evening? Will you lean your whole life on him? Let me pray for us. Jesus, it is is our privilege to know you. It is our privilege to trust you. It is our, it is our joy to, to know you. Thank you that we don't just have to give up a load of stuff um, just because we believe in, in kind of cold, hard facts. But thank you that we gain you. We gain your righteousness. We gain your forgiveness. We gain hope of eternal life. Help us to place our confidence in, what, in you and what you have done. Help us to live lives of, of gaining Christ, of knowing Christ, of trusting him. Help us to know the power of your resurrection. Pray for us particularly this, this weird time, this, this uncertain time, a time where it's hard to have confidence. Thank you that we can have confidence in you. Help us to look to you and to trust in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now um, and reflect on what we've just heard. <laughs>